Hi, everybody. This is Jose Palomino, CEO of Value Prop Interactive, and you're a host on Business Growth on Purpose. And our guest today is Richard Blank of Costa Rica's Call Center. And Richard is an entrepreneur who has built a, a full-blown business uh, south of the border, uh, interacting with American companies, uh, with a bilingual call center, not a trivial thing to pull off and to put together. And he's going to share some insights, his journey, what he's done, what he's seen happening in the business world at large. And the special treat, we're going to get some secret sauce on making effective B2B calls. So listen closely as Richard joins our show right now. Well, welcome, Richard, to Business Growth on Purpose. Great to be here today. Thank you so much, Jose. No, re really appreciate you making the time to join us here from uh, a beautiful part of the world, which we'll get into in a moment. Uh, but uh, for context sake, uh, what do you do and who do you do it for, for our audience? I am the CEO of Costa Rica's call center. We're a dedicated bilingual call center in Central America that deals with both inbound and outbound support. Wow, so you're running a full-on call center in the Western Hemisphere, but in Costa Rica, which is a beautiful country, right? Yeah. And and uh, so that begs the question, I just got to ask, uh, how'd, you, how'd you end up, I and mean, where are you from originally, and how'd you end up in Costa Rica setting up a call center? Well, I know that you're very familiar with this. I grew up in Northeast Philadelphia, and I graduated the proud Abington High School back in 1991. I doubled down on my favorite class, which was Spanish. So I went to warmer climate to the University of Arizona and was a Spanish communication major. Post-grad when I was 27 years old in August of 2000, a very good friend of mine asked if I'd like to come to Costa Rica for a couple months to teach English at his center. Well, two months turned into four years of working with my friend's center. And in my mid thirties, I started my own call center and we've been in our 14th year. I currently have 150 full-time agents and I'm sitting in my own building that can house 300 agents. So it's been a really, really good run about doubling down on my languages, believing in myself. And since I started working at my friend's center, I got to see it not as a C-level executive, but from the inside out. So those four years, I was with the proletariat, thousands of agents. And <laughs> I could see ways to enhance the experience for the agent and for the client, and then decided to throw my hat in the ring. Well, well what I love about that is you, you, were, you were doing the doing, and the way you just described it, you saw better ways. And it was interesting, not just for the customer, but also for the people who had to do the doing. Of course. And so, so what are some of the things, and this, I don't think, I'm not viewing this to be critical of your friend's business, but just things that you saw as, wow, we should do this, or it'd be great if somebody did this. What, what, what were some of those changes? Just, you know, one or two to give us kind of a sense of the kinds of things you observed as a, still a young professional figuring out what might be different. Sure. My friend did an excellent job, but whatever profession you're at in environment, sometimes it lacks empathy. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to make sure, especially in this call center industry where there's turnover and burnout, that people are not treated like a robot, they're not expendable, and they're not just a number. And so as long as you know somebody's name, put them on a level playing field and prepare them and, and treat them with some dignity, there's no reason why your attrition could be reduced and you could get the best out of people. And so I just saw from being a Philly boy, just to roll up my sleeves, know people's name, walk the rows with them, train them. I have a gamification culture, so I like to play pinball and Pac-Man with my agents. And so maybe I just did it the old school way. Okay. Just by knowing your name and treating it with that sort of respect. Wow. So, I mean, it, you know, when you hear that, anybody listening is going to say, well, yeah, knowing their names, doesn't everybody do that? But in reality, no. They don't. Um, and treating people like human beings, it's amazing how it does pay some dividends. And, and that's what you discovered. And, and what's fascinating now is you have 150 agents presently. Are these, I think I, I know the answer, but let me just ask it. Are these all, uh, for the most part, uh, nationals, natives in, from Costa Rica who are bilingual? It's a wonderful question. I do follow all Costa Rican labor laws. So everybody here has to have their legal paperwork to work here if they are an expat or somebody with dual citizenship. And so everybody here is Costa Rican or has at least lived in the United States for a period of time with their citizenship. And so they're very attuned to the North American market. But we were mentioning earlier, not just knowing somebody's name and I'm not just gonna call you champ, 
I'm going to let you know, Jose, that you got 14 last Wednesday on the phone and tell you that it was an amazing day. Or through our quality control, quality assurance department, I'm going to sit in with them, listen to one of your calls, and tell you why you were amazing when you pitched that client. So I'm not just giving you fake flattery. I will back it up to show that I invested in you. And that's the sort of thing to show that I'm a genuine boss. I'm the real deal. Wow. So and what's interesting about that, 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 that also suggests to me that you can be human and be performance oriented too. That's correct. So it's not either or. Well, it's also delegation. I, I want to make sure that people that work with me can find ways to be promoted. And I also believe in right bus, right seat. So I want to make sure that wherever you are, you could feel the best, feel the most fulfilled and, and give the most out of it. And so I'm constantly looking to promote from within. I'll bring specialists for the IT department on the outside. I will never bring somebody in that is a supervisor because they could be bringing in bad habits. Mm -hmm. And also in regards to scalability, Jose, I got to make sure that I bring in some people that have never worked at a center before. So I could mold them. I can coach and guide them. It takes a couple minutes to show them the phone system and the CRM. That, 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 that's a little bit. But if somebody has the drive, the courage, and call center jobs sometimes pay more than most vocations in Costa Rica. So once again, these people are getting a return on investment in their second language. And it's also multi-generational families here. And you and I both know that these young men and women could be taking care of their grandparents and parents paying for rent and medicine. And so that is something that I hold dear because I am feeding 150 families a month. Wow. And what I, what I love about that, though, is you were very strong in the way you said you're not going to bring somebody from the outside to show people how it should be done as much as you want that to grow like organically. You want people to be trained the right way from the beginning. And so you must uh, be doing something to really identify people with leadership ability because not everybody is ready to be a leader or a team lead or anything like that. How do you identify? How do you spot leaders? Well, once again, it's people that have initiative. And I, if somebody shows up on the first day, pen at the ready, front row center, and instead of just absorbing, contributing, mm -hmm. then immediately I will start finding other ways for them to build their confidence. And also when, when people are here, and if they are coming to the table with a skill set, they might have worked at a call center for years, I think it's great, and they could be bringing experience to the table, but it's the company culture. If you've worked at another call center, chances are you never met your boss. There's a chance that you never broke bread with them and especially played pinball with them. So instead of just once again, losing yourself amongst thousands at Amazon, HP, Intel, Oracle, or the other centers that are here, this is a smaller one. You can make a name for yourself that much faster. And I would prefer someone to earn their stripes and raise in the ranks through the people's respect. And that's pretty much how we have people that have been with me over a decade. And it gives me such foundation for me to be able to expand and grow because not only have they invested in me, but I, once again, doubled down and invested in them. And so once again, I think I'm gonna break the stereotypes of what an owner is, what a telemarketer is, because I have leverage, Jose. I, I, I could hire or fire you, make or break you. And you and I, the way we were raised, we, we prefer the former. I'm not looking to, to face somebody on the floor and make them cry and quit. Right. Our attrition is more natural. I'll lose someone because of a scheduling conflict for their college, a boyfriend or girlfriend works there, or it's closer to their home, but never are they gonna say that Richard and Jose made them feel bad, didn't pay them, or did not then put them up to speed to be their best. And so I get disappointed more than I do angry. Someone could be with me for a while and just peace out and not give me a two weeks notice, mm -hmm. people jump. So if you and I are gonna start strong, I would say I would expect us to and strong, just the business relationship, sure. not the personal one. And so sometimes I would prefer that they could just look me in the eye and thank me for the run that we had. And, and those are the some things that, that have been coming up. Mm -hmm. Right, well, you know, I mean, human nature is always gonna be on a, on a bell curve, right? There's gonna be some people that just function a certain way and on either end. And it sounds like you've created an environment which you can, uh, one is you can communicate what you what your culture is about so that's going to attract certain people and other people are going to want no part of it some people want to be anonymous you know people there are people who prefer to be very anonymous don't want to ever grow they just want to do that like punch in punch out mm -hmm. and uh 
if you have an environment, if you create an environment which allows that people maybe some more spark to say, this is a place, maybe not day one, but eventually I can grow into that. And again, because it's smaller, it's not a, a team of 10,000 people or whatever a large call center would have. Uh, I think that's very exciting. So, so that, that brings me to just a, a quick thought here, Richard, because you serve clients, I'm assuming from you know all over different kind of businesses and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been through a pretty tough, you know, two, three year time period now in the world, right? Clearly the pandemic has, was a real thing. It affected people and so on. What lessons have you for as a business owner taken from the last two years? Things that you're saying, wow, I, this could have been better or this worked just as planned. You know, what lessons, what, what insights might you be able to share from the last two years as a business owner? Wonderful. Well, adaptability, of course. The Costa Rican labor law said that we couldn't have more than 50% of the people on site. I chose to make it 20% and the agents that were here or for PCI compliance, onboarding, uh, let's just say something happens in their home in regards to internet redundancy, electricity, or failing equipment, they could always be at my station or at my call center for a turnkey station within a half an hour. But, um, you know, call centers are brick and mortar. A lot of the clients like the fact that people are here for that support. This is a synergy environment, unlike other businesses where people may not converse or relate to one another. All we do is talk. And so on the floor, you could feel that energy. You could use that sort of buddy system for training and coaching. And so I think that some of the essence that we have was removed because of COVID. Sure, we opened up more channels and we communicate via chat and Zoom calls, but you know perfectly well that a print is a lot different from a painting. And mm -hmm. when things are live, you really get that much more energy out of it. But for my own adaptability, I guess what it did was put things in perspective it made me very humble because a lot of businesses went out of business. And even though I reduced some of my staff and lost some accounts, I still survived. And so that made me very grateful. And then in addition to that, I realized priorities about my own health, my own mindset, and to not take things so seriously. And so I concentrated more on working out, eating better, having a good sleep cycle, but also finding my balance. Because if I was not able to focus and complete myself, how could I expand to others? And so, as I say before, I miss the fact of walking the rows and the people that are here because a lot, if not all of my agents are working from home, but I still try to, as I say, in my own way, reach out to them in regards to a shout out or they're doing great work or just to let them know that I care. And I guess the positive thing is that when you're on Zoom calls with people, you can kind of see what's in the background. So I get to tease them on some stuffed animals and things I see in the background. Okay. But that's kind of cool. But um, besides that, work from home and virtual is there. But before sending people home, I prefer that they at least come here to know our culture so I could work with them a little bit prior to sending them home. I just won't hire a virtual agent off the bat because it's someone that you don't even know. And I'd at least like for them to meet the executives here and to meet some other agents. And that gotcha. would definitely assist in, in that. So it's kind of like you have to you have to anchor them from the beginning to they're part of something, of and course. if you and if you do a straight and I've I've talked to people who do straight remote hiring like they're just from hello six months later they still never seen the person in person, and the, I think the technology allows you to do it, but there's a human factors as you pointed out the print is not the painting, I think that people are coming to realize that it's. It's not the same. We probably don't need to be in the office five days a week all the time, but there has to be some person to person in the same physical space connection if you're going to build a, a team or a real co corporate culture. Is that kind of what you've concluded? Besides just the culture, do you need to be with me in regards to the intense soft skill advanced telemarketing trainings that we do? I'll do it remotely, whatever. But you know perfectly well that when you're in a classroom with me standing and pitching, using your illustrators, you're definitely going to be increasing your momentum and your skill set tenfold. And so I'm more than willing to, as I mentioned before, open the cage and let them fly free and work wherever they want. But there has to be that sort of, as you say, connection from the start. And if that happens, then I think we're going to get the best out of them. 
Wow. Well, w- one thing, and you mentioned it before, Richard, I'm, I'm really interested because again, you know, I, I can't even imagine the number of calls in a given year, your, your firm is responsible for. So you, mm-hmm. so I would say, you know, some people you say that person really knows this or that you really know what it means to call somebody and connect with them. So what are some principles, maybe if, if you'd be kind enough to share with our listeners about an effective, like B2B call, because everybody has to make them, not everybody's looking forward to it, uh, whether that's a cold call or a follow-up or something, but you know, however you want to describe it, but what are some principles there to do that well? Jose is asking for my special sauce. Your this special sauce. Of course that's I'm right. sharing it with you today. You got it. Follow me along here, my friends. I'm going to walk you through a very simple phone call. First and foremost, I believe that the average attention span is 30 seconds to two minutes. So let's use that as a base. Also, every conversation has an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. If you don't land the intro, your body and conclusion doesn't exist. So let's not even focus on that. I believe that if you're doing business to business outbound prospecting, the first thing you should do is a company name spike. A lot of people through hedging and just through laser rapport, they will just ask somebody how they're doing. I prefer like for an example, business growth on purpose. How you doing today? (laughs) So I'd be asking if someone answers the call, how your business is doing today. And I would say better than the individual that was answering the call. Hey, Jose, quick question. Do you have somebody that answers the call for you at your company? Anybody there that's a, a gatekeeper or a filter over there? Yes. And what is that individual's name? Uh, Catherine. Catherine, perfect. So I call business growth on purpose. How are you today? And Catherine says, oh, we're doing great. And then she'll say to me, what is your name? And that is our first buffer boomerang technique. Sometimes the tone might not be positive, but I'm sure Catherine's always positive. But uh, someone might say, what is your name? So what I would do is I would buffer the negativity. I would use a name drop. Catherine, that's an excellent question. My name is Richard Blank. Buffer the tone, name drop. That's an excellent question. Repeat the question for active listening and send it back as a positive two or three. So that's the first question. So Catherine likes me. I say Richard Blank, Costa Rica's call center. And then she says, okay, I'll transfer you over to Jose. But before she transfers the call, I'm going to let Catherine know, Catherine, you did a great job. And I'm going to let Jose know this. That's a positive escalation. Mm. Once the call gets transferred, you answer the call and say, hello, this is Jose. How may I help you? And I go, Jose, I just got to let you know, Catherine does an excellent job. I'm using my anonymity by once again, giving a positive escalation. And you don't know who I am, but I'm giving you a gift of something. You're going to say, oh, she's amazing. Thank you so much. What is your name? Once again, a buffer boomerang. Jose, so glad you asked. My name is Richard Blank. So you like me. We're on a conversation. You ask me the second buffer boomerang question. Richard, what do you do? Jose, I'm so glad that you brought that up. This is what we do. And what the problem is with some people is they do desert pitching. They will talk for five minutes without any sort of oasis to drink and to rest. So if I'm naming you four things, I'm going to take your vertical and try to uh, horizontal and try to put it into a vertical. I will mention the first thing that we do and almost like a dessert tray where I will wait for a positive or a negative reinforcement from you. So I will say A, B, C. Oh, you like C. So we take it from vertical, you know, horizontal, go to vertical. And I start open-ended questioning, stacking you. So I'll be asking you questions for more of these explanations. And then I will be raking by saying, I'm sure you like at least one. So out of the whole list that I do, I'm sure that you like at least one of these things. And I'll start concentrating on that. In the course of a call, since it's a brand new person, you're not really sure how they speak. So that's why 30 seconds to two minutes is perfect for micro expression reading. We do this physically. I can watch your body language and how you react. But over the phone, you're losing three of your senses, your taste, touch, and smell. You can expand your hearing, but also the seeing people say you can't see your client. I say quite the contrary. You have metaphysics, you have image streaming, and there's nothing wrong with adjectives and additional descriptions because books are better than movies. And so what I'm doing is I'm speaking with you, but what I need to do is I need to keep my tone consistent of confident and empathy. That is a consistent variable. The second and third part of phonetics is rate and pitch, how fast and how loud you're going. Mm -hmm. There is a mirror imaging technique that I want your uh, audience to follow. So if somebody is speaking at a certain rate, that could be a six, seven, or eight, or their pitch, I need for you to match that. Because in the conversation, every 30 seconds to two minutes, there might be a spike or a dip. And that is for you to ask a tie-down question or a pin-down question, if it makes sense, 
or sounds good. But guess what? Your tone, rate, and pitch could still be manipulated. That's why the answering speed is really the subconscious. And that's more of your insurance policy every 30 seconds to two minutes to see if there's consistency there. And that's when you ask tie down or pin down questions. But what happens if there's a dog barking or a child in the background? We are making these Zoom calls and yeah. you do have distractions in the background. My suggestion, Jose, is to use the Me Too technique. I love dogs. And inadvertently and passive aggressively, I can tell you how much I love your dog. That's barking. Mm -hmm. I will be the active listener by asking you, what's the dog's name? And Jose, you're going to say Fluffy. Fluffy sounds great. So obviously you get the hint to put the dog outside. You come back to the call and you mentioned this word earlier, anchoring. This is usually the time instead of pitching you and trying to close you, why don't we spend a couple minutes talking about your dog? And this is usually, Jose, when you say, oh, excuse me, what is your name again? Jose, I'm so glad that you asked. Once again, my name is Richard Blank. And now you're name dropping me for the rest of the call. So now we go into the conclusion of the call. Everything's been great. You chose something you liked. I can mirror image you. I can see when you're spiking, dipping and doing a phonetic micro expression reading. And then I'm gonna rake you one more time by saying, Jose, since you still have me on the phone, are there any questions you have? You said A, B, you liked C. What about D? Oh, Richard, I like D horizontal to vertical, stacking again. Excellent. I will review your information with military alphabet. So instead of ending the call, chances are you and I are going to talk about Memorial Day weekend, people we know that served, how proud we are of the armed forces, and our conversations continue. But I'm still not done. When I follow up with you, I'm going to be sending an email and I'm going to be giving Catherine a written positive escalation on how helpful she was. So when I happen to call you back again, the Richard circle and Catherine answers the phone, she's gonna say, Richard Blank, out of the last years I've been working here, no one has ever given me a written escalation. I'd love to transfer you to Jose. <laughs> and right. here we go again. And so if your audience takes a 30 seconds to two minutes active listening, making sure you're raking, asking tie down questions, positive escalations, I think you'll be very successful. And so that to me will reduce any sort of fear or apprehension about making these business to business calls because strangers are friends you haven't met yet. And Catherine could be a plethora of information in regards to business growth on purposes, company culture, an anniversary, a promotion, your direct extension, Villanova University, you never know. Everything can come up and be named. And so this individual, is very, very valuable. So instead of trying to angle and sidestep them, no, use this person as an ally. And if you do, you might be on the phone a little bit longer. You might not make a hundred calls a day, might be 90, but that extra 30 seconds, two minutes to do the positive escalation or talk about fluffy, your numbers are gonna go through the roof and you'll be exceptionally successful. Wow, Richard, that is a masterclass in about seven minutes of secret <laughs> sauce on how to make effective calls. No, really appreciate that. I'm sure our listeners did too. And it also, it tells me how you, I'm sure you train your people, how they're, you've been effective doing this for these, you know, well over a decade now, uh, running uh, Costa Rica's call center. So if somebody listening to this episode now, Richard, wanted to know more about you, your company, how to get in touch with you, where should they go to find that out? to the first airline and buy a first class ticket to fly down and visit me. But <laughs> that, if they that, can't do that, that today, <laughs> you can give me a call at 888-271-6750. Shoot me an email at CEO at Costa Rica's call center.com. And Jose, you're going to love this. Once this goes live, I'm putting you on my Facebook fan page that has 98,000 local Costa Rican Ticos. And it will really give you a pulse on the business process outsourcing industry in Central America, where Costa Rica, we're north of Panama, south of Nicaragua, the only democratic society. There's no standing army, so all that money got put back into education. We have a 95% literacy rate mm -hmm. and the best infrastructure. And I mentioned before, companies like HP, Intel, Oracle, and Amazon are here, so we pack a punch. And finally, our ecotourism, Besides coming to visit me for business, imagine going to waterfalls, beaches, zip lining, and seeing all the monkeys and iguanas coming up to your room. So, and it's a direct flight. 
I mean, we're so close to the United States. It's just a couple hours and you'll be down here. And so I encourage everyone and anyone to come visit me in the land of Pura Vida. Wow. Well, Richard Blank, thank you for taking the time to stop by Business Growth on Purpose. We appreciate it. Loved it, Jose. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose. If you like the show, hit subscribe and leave us a review to help other people find the podcast. And if you're ready to take the next step in driving intentional growth for your business, come check out what we're doing at valueprop.com. We've developed industry-leading programs and systems to help B2B owners take control of their growth. Until then, thanks for listening to another episode of Business Growth on Purpose.